Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Let's get started this morning with the race for the White House as the focus now shifts to South Carolina. After finishing second in the New Hampshire primary, GOP hopeful former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley returned to her home state of South Carolina. She's looking to close the gap against former President Donald Trump. The state's Republican primary will take place on February 24th. A reminder, that's just over four weeks away. Haley addressed the comments that Trump made about her in his New Hampshire victory speech. He pitched a fit. He was he was insulting. He was doing what he does. But I know that's what he does when he's insecure. I know that's what he does when he is threatened. And he should feel threatened, without a doubt. Another big political headline, President Biden has received a big endorsement, the United Auto Workers Union, which has about 400,000 active members, endorsed the president on Wednesday. The head of the UAW, Sean Fain, says that Mr. Biden had earned the union support through action. The president was the first sitting commander in chief to join a picket line last year when auto workers went on strike. For the latest on the campaign, let's bring in NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray and NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba. Good morning to both of you. So, Mark, let's begin with you. We know the former president defeated Haley by about 11 points in independent minded New Hampshire. Now we head to South Carolina where Haley was the governor. So what's the state of the race there and what does Haley need to do if she wants to pull off an upset in her home state? Well, we certainly have seen this race now get chippy after the New Hampshire primary. And uh, South Carolina and the future uh, Super Tuesday contests seem to be tough sledding for Nikki Haley. Uh, the electorates in those states are much more Republican-leaning that we ended up seeing in New Hampshire on Tuesday night, where the electorate had a lot more moderate and even some crossover de uh, in, uh, Democrats who participated. Joe, the early polling in South Carolina shows Donald Trump with a sizable lead in the Palmetto State. But we need to see other surveys that have come after New Hampshire uh, primary and now that this has turned into a two-person race. Mark, Trump took to social media yesterday uh, where he threatened to blacklist anyone who donates to Haley's campaign. What exactly does he mean by that? And also, how's Haley responding? Savannah, it was in a post that he ended up making on his Truth Social Network where he said that anyone who ends up giving money to Nikki Haley will be barred from his MAGA movement. And we ended up seeing Nikki Haley respond back with a post on Twitter, uh, or uh, at, but formerly Twitter, now called X, where she ended up saying, hey, uh, go ahead and donate. Bring it, Donald, essentially. Like, let's go. And so she took to the challenge. And it is worth noting that she ended up announcing yesterday that her campaign raised $1 million from small donors after her speech on Tuesday night. I still call it Twitter, too. All right, Monica, let's bring you in here. President Biden got that endorsement yesterday from the UAW. I mean, this is interesting. The actual unions do tend to support Democrats. We've seen in recent years many of the workers shifting to Trump. So how big yeah. of an endorsement is this for the president's reelection bid? Well, it's significant, Joe and Savannah, for the president who likes to call himself the most pro-union president in American history. And it was really notable, of course, that he did go and join auto workers on the picket line last fall in Michigan. And so this is something that the Biden campaign was really hoping for, pushing for, and wanting, and something probably that the president really takes pretty personally as well, because labor is a major issue that he cares about. But you're right, there have been some other unions that are still making up their mind because of that exact issue, because there are some of their members, for instance, in the International Association of Firefighters, which had endorsed candidate Biden four years ago really early on, but they're still waiting to make up their mind. But take a listen to how this was received in the room there yesterday when the endorsement came from the union's president. This choice is clear. Joe Biden bet on the American worker while Donald Trump blamed the American worker. I kept my commitment to be the most pro-union president ever. I'm proud you have my back. Let me just say I'm honored to have your back and you have mine. That's the deal. And the UAW endorsement is really critical for some potential influence of voters in states like Michigan and Wisconsin throughout the Midwest, of course, what will likely be really critical battleground states. So that's why this is also significant. Monica, before we let you go, I do also want to ask you about an invite that we now know about to the State of the Union. The Texas woman at the center of that high-profile abortion case has received one. Remind us 
about her case and what message the Biden administration is sending with this invite. Yeah, her name is Kate Cox. She's a mother who last year was pregnant again. And at a certain point, she received a fatal diagnosis for her fetus, essentially knowing that the pregnancy couldn't continue in a way that would necessarily even be safe for her own health. But she lived in Texas, so she couldn't get an abortion given the current laws and the current ban there at that time. And she went to the courts to try to see if there was a possible appeal, a possible way that she could do it. She ultimately had to end up leaving the state to get that procedure. And we do know that President Biden and the First Lady reached out to her, had a phone conversation with her on Sunday where they formally invited her to be a guest at the State of the Union in early March. And this is really a part of the administration's push to highlight the stories of real women who have been impacted since the fall of Roe in 2022. Joe and Savannah. All right, Mark and Monica, thank you both. Appreciate it. Well, former President Trump is expected to take a break from the campaign trail this morning to appear at the civil defamation damages trial brought against him by writer Eugene Carroll. The trial is set to resume today. It was postponed after a juror got sick and former President Trump is expected to testify in his own defense. Mr. Trump has already been found liable for defamation against Carroll, including his claims that Carroll's accusations were a made-up hoax. She's now seeking at least $10 million in damages. When all the testimony is done, Judge Kaplan will decide how much money to award Carol. We have a team here to cover these proceedings. It includes NBC News legal analyst Danny Savellas right here on set with us. We've also got NBC News correspondent Yasmin Basugian outside the federal courthouse in Lower Manhattan. And that is where we will start. Yasmin, good morning. So we had this COVID delay at court hasn't been in session since Monday. So tell us what to expect today. And the big question, is there a possibility that Trump testifying will actually happen today? Yeah, that, that is the big question, right? We're going to know when he's actually on the stand. He, he, he said he would testify in Eugene Carroll's last um, trial. He, in fact, did not and said a deposition was offered. So we'll see if it happens this time around, right? All signs are pointing to, all indications are pointing to the fact that the former president will, in fact, testify. Timing-wise, if he does, that would happen later on in the afternoon. Savannah, as you came to us earlier, you said the former president is taking a break from the campaign trail to be here today. In fact, this is kind of part of the campaign trail for um, the former president on the stop um, in the primary calendar for him. Um, e. Jean Carroll's attorneys, for their part, are starting um, this morning with Roberta Myers, the editor-in-chief of Elle magazine, to speak to the importance of E. Jean Carroll's um, column in, in Elle magazine, along with other testimony as well. And then they would likely move on to the testimony, if in fact he does, to the former president um, of the United States. Yasmin, who else could we hear from today? And then do we have an idea of, of when we could expect to hear a decision on damages? So there are two witnesses that are being offered by the defense here, the former president of the United States, along with Carol Martin, who is a friend of E. Jean Carroll as well, a former um, WCBS, I believe, um, news anchor who was told initially about the assault by E. Jean Carroll uh, many years ago. Um, that is also being seen as someone who would possibly testify, although we don't necessarily know if that's going to happen. Either way, we're going to be hearing from the former president because we're going to be hearing that deposition that he offered in the initial E. Jean Carroll case. So nonetheless, we're going to be hearing from him no matter what, whether or not it's a live testimony or if, if it's from um, that deposition. When it comes to the decision, um, there is some speculation. Um, I would say that the judge um, could say, OK, Friday court is in session. Normally, we do not have court on Fridays. It could happen if, in fact, that happens, then maybe we would likely be, see, be seeing a decision from the jury um, Friday evening. But again, that is all up in the air. We don't have any facts on that as to whether or not we would actually have court in session by tomorrow. But if they do, then we could be looking at a, a decision possibly by um, end of day tomorrow. Danny, let's bring you in here again on set with us. So Judge Kaplan has set some ground rules. If the former president is to take the stand, remind us what those are and then what happens if he breaks them. Yeah, first, I wouldn't be so sure or so certain that Donald Trump will take mm. the stand. It is possible uh, that he may just be floating that idea to make the plaintiff's team have to spend a lot of time and resources preparing uh, for a cross-examination. Uh, without admitting anything, as I've told you, I have done the same thing 
before myself. Attorneys do it all the time with their clients, wait until the last minute to decide whether or not to call their client. So uh, in this case, Donald Trump's testimony will be limited. This is a damages only trial. So his testimony can really only cover possibly the issue of punitive damages, which, as his attorneys have argued, could cover whether or not he said what he said out of hatred, ill will, or spite. Those are the words that are kind of the magic words for measuring punitive damages. Maybe he gets up there and says, listen, I wasn't trying to be evil here. What I was doing instead was saying, I don't, I'm saying to the world that what she's saying is false. But then again, you get into that territory that he's not supposed to get into, which is saying that E. Jean Carroll is not a truth teller. So as a defense attorney, would you want Trump to testify? What are the pros? What are the cons? Here? General rule of thumb, when you have someone with as much, especially criminal exposure as Donald Trump, with four different criminal cases and innumerable other litigation or uh, civil cases against him, uh, you generally don't want your client under oath at all ever. But I say that, and yet Donald Trump has been deposed many times in his career, and he has a magical ability of sort of testifying without actually saying anything, keeping everything to opinion, and being very difficult to pin down. So uh, while I know E. Jean Carroll's attorneys will be thrilled to get him on the stand for cross-examination, mm -hmm. this is a case where, yes, any testimony by Trump could expose him to some kind of criminal or civil liability. But at the same time, in this case, with the issues being as narrow as they are and the judge being so committed to keeping Trump on track, uh, I expect that this will really be very limited testimony compared to what he could do, the damage he could do to himself in other cases. Right. <clears throat> Danny Savala is here with us. Yasmin Vesugian outside the courthouse where this will all happen later this morning. Thank you both so much. The state of Alabama can move forward with plans to conduct its first execution with nitrogen gas. Yesterday, the Supreme Court rejected a last-minute appeal by death row inmate Kenneth Smith. His lawyers were arguing the untested method violates the Constitution's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. Smith was convicted of murdering a preacher's wife back in 1988. Barring any court intervention, he is set to be executed today. Let's turn to some weather news. There's more flash flooding across the south this morning as the east gets ready for unseasonably warm temperatures. Let's get a check on your morning news now weather with meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Great to see you. Yeah, with the wet weather comes some milder air. We're going to see temperatures 10 to 20 degrees above normal for this time of year. But the big story remains the southern soaker. We're looking at flooding concerns once again throughout the south central states, the Gulf Coast states, into the lower Mississippi Valley and also the southeast. We have heavy rain falling once again today. We'll see rain falling tomorrow. So still 33 million people impacted by flood alerts. That's where you see the green. We also have flash flood warnings. These come in, these come out. That means fl uh, flooding is happening now or it's imminent. So you could see those maroon boxes in portions of Texas, also Louisiana, seeing some flash flooding concerns right now. And we will continue to see those concerns as we go throughout the day. This is why radar showing us that we have really heavy rain falling once again. This is coming straight from the Gulf. So a lot of moisture with it. Where you see those darker colors, that's where we're seeing the heaviest rain falling. It's sort of like just a parade of storms that keeps coming through and that's why we're seeing it over the same spots. Even seeing some lightning, hearing some thunder, we'll see the chance for some stronger storms later on this afternoon. Could see some really gusty winds, even some hail, the chance of a couple tornadoes. But it's early to get this much power to some of the storms and that's because it's coming off with that heat from uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Notice how far this rain stretches all the way to portions of the Northeast. Also New England, we had some wintry weather and we still will have the possibility of wintry weather in far northern uh, New England. But everywhere else, we're looking at plain rain. As we go throughout the next couple of days, we're going to add anywhere from one to four or five inches of rain. Some spots so could see up to six inches of rain on top of what they've already had. Uh, as you look at this, we're looking at the darker colors. The reds correspond to the higher amounts, also oranges and yellow. So again, throughout the same spots, the South Central States, the Gulf Coast States, into portions of the Tennessee Valley and also the Mississippi Valley, kind of in the same places. Because of all that rain, we're looking at the chance for flash flooding. Where you see this darker blue color, that includes cities like Chattanooga, Atlanta, Montgomery, Jackson, New Orleans, Mobile. You are under the threat for flash flooding once again. We're looking at torrential downpours in some spots, hourly rainfall rates of an inch or higher. Uh, so that's what we're going to be looking at as well. I mentioned that severe weather threat for Huntsville, uh, Tuscaloosa, Jackson, Mobile, Enterprise, down to Panama City, over to Lafayette. We're looking at the chance for winds gusting to 60 miles per hour, an isolated tornado or two, and also some hail. 
now with any of these storms. Now, we're not expecting widespread severe weather, but still could see some stronger storms as we get throughout the afternoon hours. This is a setup. There's that area of low pressure. We've had a frontal boundary draped across the area, sort of like a train track. And areas of low pressure, sort of the train cars going over the same area. So we're seeing storm after storm after storm. And that's what we continue to see, torrential rain and also storms along the Gulf. Periods of rain throughout the Northeast. You're going to need your umbrella today. Also tomorrow, it's really not later Friday until we dry out. And then guess what? Later on this weekend, we're going to see some more rain. So for tomorrow, we're looking at storm system tracking into the east, a wintry mix once again for New England as this colder air works in. Let's end with this mild air because this is good news. It feels good compared to where we have been. Philadelphia today, 55, that's 16 degrees above normal, but lots of 70s on the map. Near 80 degrees in Charleston, 19 degrees above normal, 70s in Birmingham, 60s in Lexington, also Little Rock, and Chicago, 37, much better than where we have been the past couple of weeks. Back to you guys. Spring break is here in the it's Northeast uh -huh. in January. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> All right. Thanks, Michelle. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. The FAA is putting a temporary hold on Boeing aircraft's production of its 737 MAX airliner. Boeing will also have to finish an extensive inspection process to let its MAX 737-9s return to service following that scary mid-flight incident this month on an Alaska Airlines flight. All of this comes just hours after Boeing's CEO assured lawmakers on Capitol Hill that their planes are safe to fly. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has the latest. The FAA announcing on Wednesday that it is halting all future production expansion of the MAX 9 plane. They also outlined the intense inspection and maintenance process that it will require to get the planes back in the air. Meanwhile, Boeing CEO David Calhoun here on Capitol Hill taking tough questions from U.S. Senators. David Calhoun, Boeing's top executive on Capitol Hill. Did you, you ask for these meetings, sir? Thank getting you. a grilling from Senator members of Congress. Thank you. Thank you. Calhoun making a promise to his customers. Mr. Calhoun, what's your message to passengers concerned about flying on your planes? We fly safe planes. We don't put airplanes in the air that we don't have 100% confidence in. Calhoun's comment comes just one day after the CEO of Alaska Airlines told our Tom Costello that he was angry with Boeing and its leadership team. This after a door plug on a Boeing-built airplane operated by Alaska Airlines exploded out of the aircraft in mid-flight. A problem Ben Minicucci, Alaska's CEO, placed directly on Boeing in our exclusive interview. But there's no doubt that Alaska received an airplane off the production line with a faulty door. Lawmakers are demanding answers. Alaska Senator Dan Sullivan, who represents a state uniquely impacted by the airline, grounding 30% of their fleet, said Boeing is taking responsibility for the problem. He does personally and um, assured me that this is the most important issue which I press on safety, safety, safety. Meanwhile, as Boeing works to solve this problem, senators are warning that they need to catch issues like these well before they happen. Aviation safety can't be reactive. It needs to be proactive. The NTSB plans to head back to Boeing's manufacturing plant on Friday. Their goal will be to recreate the timeline that led to that door plug explosion. And Calhoun is also expected here on Capitol Hill in the near future for a public hearing. All right, Ryan, thank you so much. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.